very colorful, very really textural. So I think you'll you'll enjoy that, and also mm -hmm. having the background from our two speakers this evening. Mm -hmm. I will introduce each speaker as we go along, and I believe they will take questions as well. Um, I don't know if we'll take them after each talk or at the very end. We can figure that out as we go. But we'll start off with our first speaker this evening. Many sheets of paper. The first speaker this evening is Lynn Stevens, Distinguished Professor of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Anthropology, and Director of the Center for Latino and Latina and Latin American Studies at the University of Oregon. Her research focuses on ethnicity, gender, class, indigenous peoples and movements, nationalism, immigration, radicalization, and structural violence linked to globalization. She has conducted research in Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, and the U.S. Her more recent books include Otro Severo, Collaborative Research on Indigenous and afro descendant Cultural Politics, We Are the Face of Oaxaca, Testimony and Social Movements, Transporter Lives, Dissident Women, and Zapotec Women. Her presentation is um, like the internal is titled so is it Zapotec Culture um, and the Oaxaca Museum of Art. Um, the museum has been a wonderful partner with Latin American Studies and with the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies. So we're very grateful about that partnership and the opportunity they've offered us with this exhibit and uh, many other projects that we have shared. Okay. Shooting it to Barzuan Arekong Noon, Barzu 
are Parhuin Beach are Ben Za. Lo que dije, what I said was, thank you very much for being here this evening, and thank you for listening, and for being here to share some information about the people of the clouds, the cloud people, the Ben Za, the Zapotec people. So I thought it would be fun uh, just to have a little bit of Zapotec language circulating in the room. Um, I learned Zapotec uh, when I did my doctoral dissertation, living uh, in the Zapotec community for several years in the mid 1980s, and I I continue to be kind of fluent. Um, I was once much more fluent, but it's one of the great gifts that I have received in my life is learning Zapotec language and learning about Zapotec history and culture through the Zapotec language, which is very different than learning it through Spanish. Um, Monte Alban is very familiar to people. Um, this is a site uh, which probably rose to have about 30,000 inhabitants. Uh, it was later inhabited by Mishpek rulers as well. Another very well-known site, um, this is a very late site, um, is the site of Mikla. Um, and what it's, it's actually fascinating. One of the most interesting things I did have done is to go visit these sites with uh, Zapotec compadres and comadres in the 1980s and 1990s. In fact, many people who lived as close as 25 kilometers or 10 kilometers away from these sites had never been. Um, that's changing. Uh, I think there's a lot of better communication between folks who are in archaeology and the National Institute of Anthropology and History uh, in Mexico. All right, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Isthmus, Zapotec language and culture. Um, there are probably about one million people today who identify as Zapotecos. Um, and they are spread not only in Oaxaca, there's probably a couple hundred thousand in Los Angeles, people in Mexico, and in fact, right here in the state of Oregon, I estimate we probably have eight to 10,000 Zapotec speakers who are living permanently. And in fact, they live in Eugene and they live in Springfield. So some of the folks that you're seeing around you, Rinyan Visa, Ben Visa, some of the folks who are right here in Eugene uh, are Zapotec and are Zapotec speakers. Um, the people I've met in and around Springfield are from Santiago Apostol, from uh, Ocotlan, from uh, Valley Towns. Uh, and if you go up to Woodburn, uh, there are, in fact, there's a, a Zapotec store uh, that you can go to that's called the Gelaguetza. You can get uh, chapulines there, you can get grasshoppers, you can get tostones, uh, mole. Uh, and if you go up to Gresham, uh, where there are several thousand uh, Zapotec folks, there's a whole market uh, with different stalls and different products from the region. Um, the Isthmus uh, is one of the places, uh, particularly uh, in Tehuantepec, in Buchitan de Zaragoza, where Isthmus Zapotec culture uh, has developed. It's always been a very independent part of Oaxaca. At different times, there were sort of secession movements. Um, and Huchitan, in particular, and Tehuantepec are fascinating because they are cities where, and this is still true in Huchitan, the primary language is Zapoteco. It's not Spanish. Today, in Huchitan, the majority of people are bilingual in Zapotec and Spanish, and also many in English. Tehuantepec has grown in a different direction. There aren't quite as many Zapoteco speakers there. Um, but Isthmus Zapotec is one of at least six different branches of the Zapotec language. Um, and for example, the Zapotec that I learned is from the valleys. Uh, if you want to say, would you like a hot, would you have a hot tortilla? Who keep you get? Okay, get is the word for tortilla. If we take it down to Huchitan and we ask one after tortilla, we say geta. Ugin, geta. So it's, it's related, um, but a little bit different. And you can find stronger variations between Zapotec to the north and the south. Um, so Huchitan 
Zapotec language and culture. There's also a long history of publishing in Zapotec. Uh, books, newspapers, and poetry, uh, and also in Mexico City publications in Zapoteco that go back to the 1800s. Uh, and Isthmus Zapotecs have been very influential. Many of you probably have in your head an icon of Frida Kahlo uh, wearing uh, women's uh, clothing and jewelry from Huchitan, uh, from the Isthmus Zapotec culture. So Isthmus Zapotec culture has figured in Mexican nationalism uh, in the work of Frida and v Diego Rivera and many other people. So uh, Rolando Rojas centers his work not only in being an Isthmus Zapotec painter from Tehuantepec, but he's also in dialogue with a long history of engagement through art and culture uh, with uh, Zapotec Isthmus uh, folks. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit, um, I know more about origins and origin stories and ideas in cosmology from uh, Valley Zapotec, but one of the things that struck me in looking at Rolando's paintings is his use of animals um, and his link between uh, origin stories of where did Zapoteco, Zapoteco people come from in, in the valleys, origin stories are that people came from Pumas, Jaguares, Ocelots. Uh, these are a couple of images that are sort of, in, in some cases, hybrid bat oscillate images. And the one on the right is an urn for ancestors. So the animals and these urns are actually a link between the gods, the ancestors, and humans today. So. I don't know, but one of the things that I see in Rolando's paintings, using these animals and the way that he paints, I'll put a few of them up there, he is trying to express that kind of connectivity. Because one of the, one of the other great Saberes pieces of knowledge I came to understand is people, when they walk through the world in Zapotec communities in Oaxaca or in the Isthmus, they are deeply connected to the landscape to the ancestors that are in the landscape, to the gods that are in that landscape, and the natural forces. So that it's not just taking a walk. And all of the pieces of the landscape, every mountain, every rock, every stream, has a name. And they're names that resonate back a thousand years or more. Um, so in, I think his art gives us a way to try to see those kinds of connections where we're Place. We're not separating nature, territory, and humans. They're, they're connected. Um, and I think he gets that from uh, Zapotec cosmology. Okay, in the Isthmus, in Tehuantepec, we see beliefs where people are descended from mystical trees and from the animals of the landscape. Okay, the Isthmus, it's water. There are lagoons, so fish lizards, turtles, shrimp. These are the animals that populate um, the landscape. They also populate uh, the markets. I'm going to just skip over this. These are, there are also animals in the Zapotec system of writing, which I don't have time to go into. Um, but there's a whole glyph system. Here, for example, we see rabbit hill and eight deer, rabbit hill the number eight, and sorry, the number eight, three plus five, and deer. Okay, so that's eight deer. So animals are in writing, they're in the calendar, they're in origin. Okay, Rolando Rojas, these are just some images that I put together. You know, there's no deep analysis here. Um, but for example, this is a very famous image of a woman with like five iguanas on her head from Huchitan that has been reproduced. It's, it's actually a photograph, I think, from the 50s. Um, and, you know, it's in, when you look at uh, the creatures that inhabit, you know, for example, this painting, Meromas, maybe there's a relationship, definitely to fish, to shrimp, to those kinds of animal forms. Um, this is called Sirena Variada from Rolando, 
And again, it's a link to the sea, to the supernatural, the human, the supernatural world, and how that is entwined. You know, it's, it's, it's a rooted uh, connection. Um, this is a picture of Isthmus women in a religious festival, a painting called Novia de la Oscuridad. And you can see, you know, some of the connections between the ritual, again, a sort of snake or lizard-like figure, a guitar, and a, a, a person, also related to the, to the sirena that we saw before. This is just a picture of camarones pescados <laughs> in the market of Pimontepec. But just, you know, the food, the seafood, the animals, they're everywhere. They're in the landscape, they're in the market, people are eating, and food is incredible. And it's a really big deal. <laughs> um, being a good cook, you know, is better than being an intellectual. Um, this is a shot of fish in the market in Ruchitan, and one of his paintings called Fiesta. Uh, this is one painting, I forget, this is one of, this is one of the ones that's up, it's a name of a child with dinosaurio, but the dinosaurio also I think relates to the lizard, to the uh, iguana, and you know, kind of that connection between the, the present day child holding the symbol that is really linked to the past. These are just a few pictures from Kuchitan. This is a, a, a desfile, a, it's a part of what's called a vela, a religious celebration surrounding the saints in Bhutan. All of the different neighborhoods have these celebrations. There's a lot of dancing. And uh, I want you to just look at the wheels on the cart, um, because on the right is a painting uh, called Ruedas con Tandillas. And he has another painting here, also involving a child eating a watermelon. Um, and the watermelon is also a symbol that has been used in a lot of paintings from Oaxaca, Oaxaca painting. One of the most famous is from uh, Rufino Tamayo, my, my era there, but it's a painting called El Comedor de Sandillas, the Watermelon Eater, from 1949, which I think just sold for like $3.5 million. Okay, my last two minutes. Um, I want to try to link um, what Orlando is doing with some of the more contemporary art in Oaxaca. The three of us actually were involved. We have all been involved uh, with this collective of artists known as ASARO, Asamblea de Artistas Revolucionarios de Oaxaca. Um, they uh, were part of a broader movement in Oaxaca in 2006 that involved uh, sort of taking over the city, putting up new structures of governance, but also produced an incredible art, not only on the walls of the city, but now followed by dozens of collectives and studios and uh, young people. So they really had a role in, in changing the aesthetic and visual environment of Oaxaca and have been involved in creating what I would call a, a political subjectivity that they call El Pueblo de Oaxaca. In other words, creating a broad sense of who Oaxaca is and what they look like. Um, this, um, th these are just a few examples, and their work has been on walls, but they also do a lot of graphic art. Um, and we are going to bring two of these artists uh, to the University of Oregon in June uh, with a workshop, in conjunction with a workshop we're doing with K through 12, I'm sorry, middle school and high school teachers as a part of a grant that Latin American Studies in CLOSS received from the U.S. Department of Education called Enhancing Latin American Studies um, at the University of Oregon. And the museum is our partner. We're holding the workshop in the museum. Um, so these are a few of the images. Um, their work is very important in terms of citizenship. I counterpose this example which is from another very famous graphic artist, uh, Adolfo Mexica. Uh, this is a 1968 engraving that was made before the Olympics. There was a lot of repression, so the chain across the mouth saying Libertad de Expresión. And in 2007, Asarro did this stencil uh, telling people to boycott a state commercialized version of a folk festival 
and to support a popular version. And the icon they're using is a Zapotec dancer who's carrying a gun instead of a traditional rattle. Um, these artists have also been in dialogue with other uh, indigenous artists. In this case, Fernando Oliveira has a very well-known painting from 1989, uh, which is all, he, he is from Huchitan, uh, of women in Huchitan, it's called Resiste. These are market women. And uh, one of the artists, uh, Beta, uh, of Asaro has this painting that uh, of a, a, a woman from Cuautla de Jimenez, but it also says resiste. So he's obviously in conversation uh, with this other painting. Uh, and this is a final image of Asaro. And I'm just going to close. I'm going to uh, abuse my uh, access, but to say that um, I am uh, raising some funds. Uh, the Jill Hartz, the director of the museum, is going to uh, once I have put $500 up and I'm looking to match that with another $500 to make a purchase uh, of Asaro graphic prints, uh, probably about 30 of them, they're quite cheap, um, to bring here to put in the permanent collection of the museum and then we will also use them in that workshop. So thank you uh, and that's my, my part. So our next speaker is Stephanie Wood. Stephanie Wood is a Fulbright Scholar and a Senior Research Associate and Principal Investigator in the Center at Oregon for Research and Education. She holds a doctorate in Latin American history with a specialization in Mexico. She first went to Oaxaca in 1973, but has been working there more intensively since 2006. And her presentation is Oaxaca, the Arts and Education. Thank you very much. I'd like to add my thanks to those offered by Lynn for uh, the support in organizing this event and in general supporting Latin American art. Uh, of course, I was a baby in 1973 when I first went to Oaxaca. But, <laughs> uh, but we've been going regularly. And in 2006 was when the three of us all landed there in the midst of a social movement. And it was very exciting, electrifying, and got me excited about Oaxaca again. I am going to speak a little bit less about Ro Rolando Rojas's art, but I'm going to kind of build on some of what Lynn was speaking to you about as Oaxaca as a place for the arts in general. And um, we didn't even compare notes on what we were going to say, but it works out very well, I think. Okay, I have been taking groups of U.S. school teachers to Oaxaca for what we call summer institutes funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, which pays us as educators, it pays the teachers who get their, you know, have their fair, lodging, food, everything. It's a really wonderful uh, grant that supports um, our concept, which is U.S. school teachers wishing to add more Latin American, or in this case, Mexican culture and history to their curricula that they will use in their classrooms here in the United States. Many of our U.S. school teachers are finding growing numbers of Latina Latino students, in particular in the West here, a lot of Mexican students, but even in North Carolina. And they, uh, first of all, they don't know much about these students in their room, but the other students don't know anything either. So in general, they're trying to address um, some failings in our educational system, and uh, we're trying to help, help them do that. So the institutes consist of four weeks with uh, in the month of July, basically, with a week devoted to archaeology, uh, a, a week to manuscript studies, community arts, and film. And Lynn and Gabriella are co uh, core faculty with me in community arts with Lynn and film with Gabriella. Our principal theme uh, for the four weeks that unites the entire institute is, uh, and it has its emphasis on indigenous cultural survival and contributions um, that indigenous people make to Mexican society today. 
The next few slides I'm not even really going to say much about, but I just, they come from a book called Mexico el genio que perdura, the genius that persists in Mexico. And, it, they, and the point is to show 16th century images side by side with modern day images to show that there is this indigenous cultural survival and continuity in many areas of Mexican life. These are our corn storage containers called Cuescomatl. These are indigenous healing uh, activities using herbs and plants and things. Just what can we say? That's a pre-Columbian art piece, and this is a modern image. Carrying firewood, spinning cotton and wool, weaving, the fine work of weaving from pre-Columbian, in this case, codex on the left. The voladores de Papantla, who represent the four cardinal points in the center. They also represent the cosmos in its layers, vertically. Dancers who still wear jaguar costumes, even if they're no longer always skins. A deer head, headdress, perhaps. Okay, those are just a few, and the, and the book is wonderful. There are dozens, dozens of wonderful images which connect past and present. Now just a few slides to share with you. Our first week, which is about, as I mentioned, archaeology, but we also include architecture. And really, each week is not so distinct from the next. Things bleed uh, and flow together. This is a photo from Monte Alban, uh, one of the sites that Lynn introduced you to. Uh, this is the ball court, which takes the shape of a capital I, very commonly, although the ball courts do vary somewhat in size and shape across Mesoamerica. But it was a, a pan-Mesoamerican uh, ball game. And one can look in manuscripts and find images of the ball game. We can also go, there's a museum in Oaxaca that has a pottery piece that shows the game at play, a pre-Columbian pottery piece, so we can kind of see the social environment, the observers of the game, the players and what they were doing and so on. And the game is still played today in Oaxaca, so some of our group will go and watch, witness how the game is played today. Uh, another feature of the first week is we go to archaeological sites that have not only pre-Columbian buildings that are being sort of studied and reconstructed, but in one site that we go to, we also look at the early colonial buildings. And so this is um, Casa de la Casica, it's called, the House of the Indigenous uh, Female Noble. And uh, it has a remarkable design. This is the only building I know of that still exists in Mexico that has this particular pattern close to the roof line which are symbols of power and preciosity. And we can look in manuscripts and see uh, these same symbols uh, drawn. This is the Palace of Montezuma, which would have been in uh, the Templo Mayor area of downtown Mexico City. Spent, it was taken apart in the same stones used to build colonial buildings. So uh, we don't have his palace still today, but it would have looked something like that, only grander, uh, as the Casa de la Casica in Oaxaca. Uh, we visit, um, in our second week, we look more closely at manuscripts um, to see what they can tell us, what indigenous voices and perspectives can come to us from the past by looking at manuscripts that they wrote and they painted. Lynn showed you the Zapotec writing. There were pre-Columbian methods of writing and they adapted well to uh, the alphabetic writing in the colonial period. We have a lot of manuscripts that are written in indigenous languages, so we look at those. We also look at pictorial traditions. Uh, the glyphic f form of writing would continue, um, and also pintura, simple paintings of uh, ideographic, for instance. And uh, European image styles would merge with indigenous ones. This is a 16th century lienzo, big cloth, uh, which was the history of uh, community here in what's called the Mixteca, which the Mixteca is another language, one of the 16 languages that Lynn mentioned that are, is spoken in Oaxaca. So this is in one of the Mixtec communities. And this um, lienzo was rolled out and shown to us, and it hadn't been on public display in 11 years. So there were 10 and 11 year old kids in this community who'd never seen this piece of their local history, who were very excited to come out and take a look while they were meanwhile showing our group of teachers, which was a huge honor. Uh, we had to go before the municipal president and have kind of an audience and uh, 
certain protocols had to be followed. The tall fellow with the long hair standing in the room addressing the president, he is a Dutch scholar, a great colleague. Uh, he had this blonde hair, it's turning gray now, Sebastian van Duisburg, and he was the one who organized our visit and got, got them to get out the manuscript for us, manuscript painting on cloth. It's interesting here, the uh, municipal president uh, is a male, and there's another male sitting at his side. In pre-Columbian times, it would have more likely been a couple, male and female. So there's a change for you. But it is significant that an indigenous elite ruler is still ahead of this town. And that's one of the reasons we have indigenous cultural survival uh, across Mexico, not just in Oaxaca. But to give people some you know, role in their own governance was really significant, even if there were colonial, say, Spanish colonial officials overseeing that, supervising it somewhat, at least early on, it was from quite a distance, so it allowed them to solidify their position. And some of those elites were, you know, cooperating, and that's how they got to continue to hold that position. But anyway, this is a detail from that large cloth I showed you, and this is a, a couple sitting on a mat facing each other. And so one of the things we do in the study of the art of these pictorials is what we call iconography, which is dissecting you know, the details and reading them, understanding what the meaning is, the embedded meaning. And so you have, for instance, here, um, you know, okay, these are human beings. Um, is one a female, one a male? You know, just learning how to recognize that. The women often sat with their legs folded underneath them, so there's a clue to which one is female. The legs bent under. The men sat with the knees up, coming up toward the chin. So a completely different posture, one from the other, helps us know. And then they had certain hairstyles and so on. Other clues and clothing, the kechkemi, the certain blouses that women wore and the capes that men wore and so on. Here we also see the glyphic writing spelled out in their names. Um, we have five lizard here. Remember Lynn was talking about lizards. We have here three monkey. Um, so uh, these are their name glyphs, the line Draw, is drawn from the glyph to the head of the person and shows, you know, this is who we're identifying these people for you. And the shared mat, this woven mat called a petat in Nahuatl, uh, shows that they were, you know, enjoying this special position of power in the community. And in the big pictorial, there's oh, couple after couple after couple. It's partly genealogical and partly a ruler list. Um, another detail from this manuscript, just before I go on, to show that we not only have sort of pre-Columbian forms, uh, pictorial forms on the cloth, but also colonial ones. So here we have a Spaniard sitting in a curule chair, which is the chair at the top, and he has a, a hat, a sombrero, and he has a beard, a big full beard. Um, so that distinguishes him from, those are just iconographic elements that you learn to identify, distinguishes him from the indigenous noble lord at the bottom who's been hanged at the order of the Spanish overlords. So change, yes, change did come and the Spanish colonial authority was very significant. Um, and then in the symbol, symbols on the right, again, we have glyphic identification of this person's name and the AO symbol of the date. So our teachers uh, become really fascinated with the pictorial. Uh, manuscripts and paintings on cloth, and they think that this is an interesting way to introduce sort of indigenous writing and painting to their students. And so you can still buy fig bark paper, which is a pre-Columbian form of paper. It looks a little bit different today, but it's still being made. And you can buy it in Oaxaca, and the teachers were, were practicing making codices, and then they were going to teach their students how to do that. Uh, Luis Dominguez is a, a Nahuatl speaker, one of, again, the 16 languages spoken in Oaxaca. He comes from the state of Guerrero and sells uh, paintings painted on this fig bark paper, as well as on wood and other uh, media. Anyway, he um, came into our classroom and spoke to us and told us all about his work in Nahuatl, then translated it into Spanish with Gabriela's assistance interpreting there. Um, we also took one of his mas masterpieces and animated it online. Uh, this was a project of some graduate students here at the U of O. And um, let's see if I can get this little link to show you how they have animated this painting, which is a representation, Luis tells us, of life in his community, but it's somewhat um, stylized or modified to, let's see if I can get it to come up, um, to respond to what tourists might be interested. Scene. With a bride standing on a chair, about to toss her wedding bouquet, 
to other women who wait behind her with their arms raised. This type of wedding represents another introduced European tradition, with the white gown, veil, and train all intended to cover the bride and to refer to her purity. It shows men at work in the milpa, which comes from mealy, field, in Nahuatl, bent over and using a variety of tools, weeding the cultivation. So that gives you an idea of how we, uh, the students had fun animating the, uh, the pictorial, but it shows, you know, a cockfight, uh, a pond where they fish, they get their food from the, 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 the cocoa palms where they knock down the coconuts and gather them, so on and so forth. Scenes of daily life, and, and Luis tells us, yes, we kind of found that tourists bought these more than others if we had the wedding scene or, you know, whatever. So they're responding and modifying what they're painting in part to a market demand. Um, we also see that happening in the communities, and this is in the third week now with Lynn as core faculty. We, we visit a number of indigenous communities where arts are still practiced for, in some ways, like in this example, the komali, the large griddle uh, that is what people cook on over an open fire, still being made the same way for at least 2,000 years. Um, and she, uh, this woman demonstrated for us while Lynn interpreted, because this is a Zapotec community, so the woman was explaining what she was doing in Zapotec and showing us her tools, and Lynn was telling us pretty much what we were seeing. And then at the end there you can see they will also make figurines. They also will make some things to respond to the market, so they're not just producing traditional items, but a, a wide range of uh, pottery. And um, I can show you, we'll come back to this at the end if there's time, uh, but uh, we have a number of videos that are made in association with each of the visits that we do so that then the teachers have something they can show in their classroom and Gabriella's. One of the video, the filmmakers that was working with us and uh, also the teachers themselves were filming and putting their videos online. We also uh, visit a community, another Zapotec community, where um, we learn about spinning and weaving and the designs in the textiles. This is uh, Lynn actually speaking to us in this photo. She, sp she was speaking to us about some of the patterns. And you can see when uh, she showed us Mitla, the patterns in the architecture, the pre-Columbian architecture, resonate in some of the patterns that you find in the, in the textiles still today. So you can see particularly some of these patterns, you know, repeating. Uh, that we also find, though, uh, textiles where you have, yeah, Escher and all kinds of, you know, sort of modern art themes that have been embraced and woven into the rugs and uh, tourists like that. Um, Gabriella made a special video uh, interviewing this gentleman who was telling us all about the uh, spinning and the weaving. Uh, it's a wonderful resource as well. Another uh, community that Lynn takes us to is Arrasola, and there are a number of communities that make these sort of fantastic carved wooden figures that are also painted in bright colors in a in very detailed way. They're very imaginative and uh, connect again, though, the humans with the natural and supernatural, if you will, and the environment. Um, and, and in this case, they're fairly, um, recent innovation, a response to market impulses. Um, not so much can we make a, a, a strong connection to pre-Columbian artistic traditions, but certainly the way people see animals and the way that, you know, their idea of the cosmos has to enter into these creations. Um, I'm not saying very much about it, but I, I think we could come back to it if you want to. And finally, I just want to touch on this. As Lynn said, we've all been um, kind of captured by the street art, which can take the form of graffiti or stencils or posters that are made, mass produced and glued quickly and slapped up on the walls. Um, and studios that are emerging, even gallery shows now and international traveling exhibits that are coming from these groups of artists. Um, it's just it's been fascinating to me. So we often have teachers also focusing on photographing the street art, which is very ephemeral from one year to the next. It's, it can be completely different what you find on a wall from what was there the year before. The city uh, pays young people to go around and paint them all over, paint the walls and cover the art that's just gone up, you know, or been up for a while. Um, but I just wanted to show an example of how, you know, we've been you photographing and archiving the images of this art because it is ephemeral, but we want a record of it so that we can study it. And uh, here's an example of 
the Virgin of Guadalupe and how her, she's a representation of the Virgin Mary, who is very important in Mexican art and history, uh, and her image is being tweaked or played with or uh, repurposed, if you will, for political ends. Um, and here's the more traditional image of her in the Basilica in Mexico City with the Mexican flag, you know, right, right next to the image of the Virgin, which kind of is a, hits you over the head that this is an ethno-nationalist uh, symbol. Um, but she's called La Morena, the dark-skinned one, and she spoke in Nahuatl to a, an indigenous young, young man named Juan Diego and so on and so forth. The story of her is a very Mexicanized version of an apparition of the, of the Virgin Mary. Anyway, so going back to the way these street artists are taking her image and playing with it, here we have a kind of ex voto of, you know, thanking the Virgin for having survived the bullets of the government uh, of this militarized Mexico. That's what it says across the bottom, and this is 2006. And uh, in 2009, another representation of the Virgin that was all over the place uh, the Virgin of the Barricades, and she's wearing a gas mask because in 2006 when the teacher, teacher's movement got going, the government was throwing tear gas bombs from helicopters into you know, popular um, unarmed assemblies of people. Um, and so there were terrible, you know, terrible effects of the tear gas, <coughs> but people started getting gas masks, some people anyway, and so they put one on the Virgin of the Barricades here. Um, here is, I'm sorry, this is a little bit out of focus, another image that was shot very quickly um, of a kind of humble Mexican woman. You might see her in the market or you know, someplace like that, and she's in the aura of the Virgin of Guadalupe, and she has a scarf over her face, perhaps partly you know, to protect her from the tear gas or, and also keep her identity safe because people were being disappeared and um, beaten up and so on, who were associated with the teacher's movement. Um, and here, another example, these are all from Asaro, uh, the organization that Lynn was talking about. But here we have a campesina, sort of an in indigenous female with her baby, as I showed you in the pre-Columbian way of wrapping the baby in the rebozo and carrying him or her on, on the back. Um, but this you know, remaking of the image of the Virgin as poor, as, mm, as um, you know, brown-skinned, as uh, you know, a humble female, is, uh, I think, a really fascinating phenomenon that's going on. And uh, here's another example where the Virgin herself, you know, has this scarf this over her face, and the woman and child are both wearing those here, sitting on the chair. So she's watching over. She's this, there's this protector, protector and um, element that has always been a part of the Virgin Mary. Kind of, she's the intermediary between the people and you know, God or what have you anyway, this just is a tweaking of that role to say, oh, these rebels, the Virgin is protecting, you know, these people. Um, and finally, uh, you know, putting the rebel woman in, you know, in the aura of the Virgin of Guadalupe. And here she says, I, I am with you, estoy con ustedes. So, you know, I'm one of you. The Virgin is becoming the rebel. Um, and I'm just going to end with that image because I think it's very dramatic. Um, but to summarize, I hope I showed in these 15 minutes that um, we can easily see a link between ancient and colonial art and Mexican lives today. I mean, there, the presence lives on. Um, there's this dialogue between the past and the present that Lynn was talking about that I see very much, very powerful in Oaxaca, and it's mediated through a wide range of artistic uh, media. But indigenous voices and perspectives are a big part of that, um, contributing to it, not everything perhaps. I think you can see these emblem, emblems coming through time that are still very big and very much a part of, of the art today, which is vibrant and constantly changing, very exciting. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you.
Yes. Okay. Our final speaker this evening is Gabriela Martinez. Gabriela is Associate Professor in the School of Journalism and Communication and Associate Director for the Center for the Study of Women and Society. Her research focuses on international and global media, and her creative work covers different Latin American regions, including South America and Central America. She has produced documentaries and has conducted research in Peru, Mexico, and Guatemala, and her most recent work includes Women, Media, and Rebellion in Oaxaca. Her presentation. is Indigenous Lens, Media Development, and Self-Representation in Oaxaca. If this is working, but I'm gonna try to project it. Um, and I'll try to be brief so that we can have enough time to, to discuss and talk about the other uh, presentations. Um, I'm talking tonight about um, Ojo de Agua Comunicación, which basically means springs of water communication. And uh, this is a very interesting group of uh, filmmakers and video makers and also radio producers. Um, the, the history of this collective, I think it, it, it really matches up what Lynn and uh, Stephanie have been talking about but from the perspective of media, how this group of people are using uh, video and radio to really uh, recover and, and preserve all the different histories of the state of Oaxaca, and also to do it uh, from bottom up. It's, it's a grassroots movement. Uh, basically working with indigenous communities, going out to indigenous uh, uh, villages and helping them to produce their own media and to recover their own uh, culture and their own histories. So, but the, the, the history of uh, this group of people, it's very interesting because it's linked to a whole political project of the Mexican government. And, it basically began in uh, 1985 when the INI, or former INI, today it's called uh, the National Commission for Development, uh, Audiovisual uh, Development, and, 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 or Indigenous Development, sorry. And basically in the 1980s there is a shift, and not only a shift internally in the politics of Mexico for media development, but also a shift in ethnography. And for the most part, all these indigenous groups, uh, not only in Mexico, but I would say all across the Americas, were usually uh, portrayed and were filmed and were photographed by ethnographers, right? Or by anthropologists, by historians. So in the 80s, we see this shift even in, uh, within disciplines. And also we start seeing a lot of indigenous people becoming highly educated and wanting to tell their own histories and their own stories and uh, using all the media and all the knowledge they are acquiring. Uh, so as part of that, the INI um, decided to uh, give emphasis to media production and to put in the hands of indigenous communities some audiovisual uh, and radio also um, technology. So it's a transference of technology. At this point, it's very important, 1985, because that's when we see the first uh, co-direction of a, a so-called white person with an indigenous woman, Theophila Palafox. It's an uh, indigenous woman who co-directed a documentary about weavers in Oaxaca in 1985. And this is the first instant when, you know, an indigenous woman is in charge of directing an ethnography and also directing a media project. And it was a documentary they produced. Um, by eight, 1989, the INI created this project for audiovisual media transfer. And they start giving f funding in different parts of Mexico, not only in Oaxaca, but Oaxaca becomes, uh, over time, this prominent place. 
And uh, they are bringing technology and training people and sending people out to form collectives and to, and, and to work with the communities and beginning to identify particular people, young people who were interested in learning the technology. By the way, along with media, with visual media, they are working also in radio. Mexico has probably is one of the countries in, in Latin America that has the, the largest networks of indigenous radios and with all their languages. And, and that's fascinating. And it was also uh, a, a political project, basically. And obviously, over time, that has changed with neoliberal policies. Many of those radios, many of these media collectives have been suppressed and repressed by politicians because they have now move more onto an independent way of thinking, and they no longer respond to the neoliberal project of the Mexican government, and they actually are resisting through technology and through the content of their productions. They are resisting what the government has been doing. So it has become problematic in a way. It's one of these contradictions where the state finds something and over time basically backfire, right? Um, so in 1992, we see um, the, the, the birth of different national projects. And at this point in the 1990s, the government is financing this, but these collectives are becoming more independent and they are working already on their own. They are developing their own narratives and they are developing also their own uh, way of storytelling which is different if you watch uh, television in Mexico, you know, Televisa or TV Azteca, which are like the two big major and only, basically only networks in the country. You can watch it here. If you watch Univision or uh, Galavision, they import a lot of those products produced in Mexico. It's very different when you watch television or, or content produced by indigenous people and that from Televisa. I mean, the way they are telling stories is different because they are basically drawing from, you know, 2,000 years of history and way of telling stories as well. The narrative works differently. It's not a linear narrative. Many times it's circular narrative uh, or it goes in different ways and then they come back to the main plot of the story. I mean, it's very, very different and it's fascinating to see that. So in 1994, we have um, this person, Guillermo uh, Monteforte, who I met back in 2006. He already was directing Ojo de Agua, but he is one of the forces behind uh, Ojo de Agua and one of the forces behind indigenous media in the state of Oaxaca. Um, so I just listed here some names just for information, basically, of the first indigenous producers that came out of uh, Mexico and that actually produced several documentaries. Many of them have produced more than two or three documentaries of have been working with other uh, filmmakers. Many of them have done co-productions with other indigenous people in other parts of the Americas. Actually, several of them are part of CLAPKI, which is a, a, a whole world organization for indigenous media. And since 1992, with the, um, with the celebrations or commemoration or however you want to define the 500 years of the encounter of two worlds, uh, basically the conquest of the Americas, uh, since that time, 1992, there was a lot of funding from Spain and other countries to finance this, the creation of a, of a whole America's uh, indigenous media movement. So a lot of these indigenous uh, filmmakers from Oaxaca and other states in Mexico have been working sometimes in co-production with other native peoples in the Americas. And they, they have done really good work. And now they have um, a festival that it's a, every other year, they have an international festival. And this festival of indigenous cinema or video and video making uh, has taken place in Oaxaca twice already. 
And basically, Ojo de Agua and some of the former um, members of these collectives have been kind of the driving force behind this uh, America's effort for media or indigenous media. So in 1999, it's when Ojo de Agua becomes an independent collective. And they uh, start producing their own things. They still receive some funding from the gover Mexican government, but at the same time, they branch out. And because they become independent of the, uh, of the state project, they began receiving money and, and applying for international grants. So basically, they operate with funding from the Mexican government that has been diminishing, noticeable, and from grants from Europe, primarily, in Canada. So who they are, basically, these nine wonderful people here. Um, some of them identify themselves as indigenous uh, video makers or indigenous peoples. Uh, Zapotecos primarily and Mixtecos, some of them, and some others don't identify as indigenous, and they are mestizos basically, but they work for indigenous people and with indigenous people. They are the ones who uh, are running Ojo de Agua today, and basically they are the ones going out to communities and training people in communities as well producing documentaries. Basically, they have three ways of working. One is training. So they do a lot of capacity building in indigenous communities. Uh, in production, they produce documentaries, and they also help indigenous people to produce their own work. And they do a lot of dissemination or distribution. And they have an impressive catalog. Actually, if you write down the name and you Google this organization, the catalog they have all the way from back in the 1990s to the present, probably it's about over 800 different documentaries in all categories. I mean, you have environmental things, um, leadership, uh, empowering w indigenous women, all kinds of things. It's really, really impressive, the, the, impressive, the amount of production. Uh, here, I wanna show you a little clip most parts are going to be in Zapoteco or Mixteco, maybe Spanish. Uh, one thing that is interesting with the work they do is that they rarely translate into English. It's really hard to find anything in English that they have done. And basically, there is a whole philosophy there and a rhetoric there that it's, this is for indigenous people. This is media to be consumed by indigenous people inside Mexico. So they rarely are producing with the, the you know, with a foreign uh, audience in mind, although a lot of foreigners use their work. Okay, this is a clip, a demo that they have. It's about three minutes. Um, and I hope it works. Soy costeño del vacío, se los digo con franqueza, donde se aprende a bailar, a zapatear en la artesa. explaining what their objectives are there, the different objectives of working with uh, indigenous communities, and showing the places where they go. This 
is the catalog for one of the uh, festivals that they, get, they did in Oaxaca. They have won a lot of international prizes as well for uh, media. Mi comunidad se llama Santa María Izcatlán. Pertenecemos al distrito de Teotitlán de Flores Magón. Tamulté de las Sabanas está ubicado en la parte norte del municipio de Centro, exactamente donde inicia la reserva de la biosfera de los pantanos de Centro. Estamos en el municipio de San Mateo del Mar, somos el pueblo Icoz y todo el pueblo vivimos de la pesca. Este lugar es del pueblo y el pueblo manda en este en este lugar. Y es cuando todos sepan y todos que este pues tiene chimes, tiene Porque ya es justo y tiempo que la mujer participe, porque la mujer vale mucho. Aquí más bien estamos pensando en un acto de justicia, un reconocimiento de la presencia de los negros. Todo lo que está perdido en el más antes. Quiero ver lo que brille, así como brillan las estrellas. Me a, me a, Shani, que no se muera. Okay, uh, I'm gonna st stop there that, uh, that clip, but that, that's a demo that they uh, have put together to show all the different type of things that they do and they cover the different topics. And I think it actually, we didn't plan it, but it speaks really <laughs> to the uh, previous uh, two uh, presentations where, you know, the, if this would have been filmed by foreigners who don't know the culture, probably, some things may have been slightly different, where the focus is. While here we see that they really know and understand a lot of their environment, their natural environment, uh, the way they relate uh, with each other, the idea that community is the center of things, uh, the, the notion that things have to change within communities for women, and they are basically gathering that and helping local people, indigenous people, to really work with that and, and, and work with what they have there and just providing them uh, the, the technology to, to uh, gather all of that um, information. And um, to finish, I would like to show, uh, or well, not show, but just, I'm gonna play a little bit of this because it's primarily in Spanish. Um, but one of the, of the beautiful things they are doing nowadays is radio novelas, radio novelas, radio soap operas, but for indigenous people and with indigenous people. So basically they go to the communities, they write the screenplays with them, the different episodes based in the needs of the community, the, the problems that they have there, and then they put the, the radio novela out. This is the latest one, Los Pasos de Luna, the Steps of Luna. Luna is the main character, a woman, and it has 20 episodes. And you can actually download all the episodes. So if you go and you Google Los Pasos de Luna, you have a whole page with all the MP3 files, and you can download all of that. And it's really nice. I've been listening to them almost <laughs> daily because they are really, really... For those of you who, who teach Spanish, I think that will be ideal. Uh, so here, just the beginning for you to get a taste. Mujer, eres 
cascada que por la mañana cantas al nuevo día. Eres como la madre tierra, fértil, hermosa y fuerte. Luna, mujer indígena, generosa y valiente. Tejes los rayos de luz para hacer tu vestido. Usas las hierbas y haces los rezos como te enseñó tu abuela. Luna, mujer que habitas la noche. Luna que hablas en silencio con los animales. Luna que proteges la vida y defiendes a las mujeres. Luna que iluminas mi camino. Deja que te acompañe y viaje contigo. Quiero seguir los pasos de luna. ¡Ya llegué, Tonis! Ahora sí ponte la entrada del programa. En cuanto termine la canción la pongo, Luna. Mientras, acomódate. ¿Traes alguna grabación? Ah, ah de veras. Aquí está mi memoria. Está en la carpeta de testimonios que dice Francisca. So, I hope you are already hooked with the radio novela. <laughs> Just Google it and then you can download the 20 episodes. But um, I think it's really, actually, when I, this is the first episode, I, I listened to that and I, and I was like, wow, this is great, this is cool, you know, and, and I keep listening to the others. So they really have grasped what people like and the voices of, uh, of the participants or the characters are, you know, local people, local uh, language, all the colloquial language and all of that. It's, it's really uh, interesting, but it's also like social media because not social media in the sense of Twitter and Facebook, but what traditionally in media studies or media development we call social media, which is a focus on social issues, social ailments that we can use media to help promote uh, a healing within the community. And I think that's what they are doing. So this la last slide just to show you, um, here is uh, Guillermo Monteforte and uh, Juan Jose Garcia. Uh, that was the second time that they, host, uh, they hosted the, um, the International Indigenous Film Festival in Oaxaca. And uh, on the other side, uh, that image is basically a photograph they took um, when several people got together for a co-production. Indigenous people, people from Canada, white people. I mean, they are crossing the barriers. It's no longer we are indigenous here and white people here, but actually working together and, uh, and teaching to each other, which I think is really wonderful. And uh, here, when they got a prize in one of these uh, film festivals for the work uh, they are doing, that's basically most of the people from Ojo de Agua. So I'm gonna leave it there and open up for, uh, for a conversation with you. Thank you. Well, you've all given us the impression that there's a very healthy uh, preservation of not only language, but all sorts of cultural traditions among these indigenous groups through, I guess, local, regional, and even federal institutional efforts. But I, I wonder if this has always been the case or always will be the case. So I actually have two questions. One is, you know, 25 years ago or so, uh, wh where are some of these languages and traditions uh, under pressure, under pressure for, for not surviving because of the lack of some of this activity that you've demonstrated for us is going on today? And secondly, uh, w you know, what is the future? What are the current pressures uh, on survival of some of these indigenous cultural practices and traditions? Uh, I think of globalization, computer technology, becoming the common denominator, so. Maybe, is this on? <laughs> anyway, um, <coughs> I think it was about to, well, certainly after the year 2000 that the National Endowment for the Humanities began giving grants along in conjunction with the National Science Foundation to support what, uh, what they call uh, documenting endangered languages of, of the world, really. Um, but it was uh, becoming a crisis situation in Mexico. Really, it has been a, de a decline, in a way, of indigenous language 
numbers of speakers over time. And even now, many languages are still declining, although there's a greater awareness and an effort to stop and regenerate, preserve and regenerate, uh, revitalize. Is a, you hear revitalization a lot. And um, so there are many, many activities to document languages before they've disappeared. I mean, we have colleagues who are working in the state of Oaxaca with some of these, you know, the, the minority languages of the 16 that maybe have, you know, six speakers left um, and so they're working like mad interviewing them documenting their language before they're all gone um, and I work with probably with Nahuatl which is the language that has one of the, the most speakers um, one of the Maya languages Mixtec and Zapotec there are four um, big ones but even in Nahuatl I'm not sure we're gaining ground even though there's a lot of resources now that the federal district in Mexico it's been declared by law that Nahuatl now be taught in schools. But they aren't providing the resources to hire the teachers or the material to, you know, acquire the materials that are needed to teach these languages. So it's, you know, it's you win some, lose some. It's a constant struggle. But um, it's, you know, it's hard to quantify exactly. I feel like we're losing ground in many areas, but we're gaining ground in others. So we're all just doing as much as we can and trying to get the word out that this is a worthwhile activity. Um, but uh, my colleagues have to well, I get it's, a, it's a very important and interesting question. Um, I, I also think something that's very interesting is there are people who identify as Zapotec or indigenous who do not speak the Zapotec language. Um, and that's very important um, in Latin America um, where establishing indigeneity is no longer done by criteria established by anthropologists and bureaucrats in the census. Um, it's established by people who self-label and proclaim who they are. That's also happened with Afro-descendant populations. One of the things you noticed in the Ojo de Agua video was claiming uh, the Los Pueblos Afros de Oaxaca, um, which is, a, is, is another way of um, documenting, preserving, understanding diversity of, of many different kinds. Um, in terms of language, um, you, I mean, in some cases we see a shift to bilingualism, and I think it's very, it's very much attached to what's going on economically, what's going on politically, so that Huchitan continues to be a very strong community of Zapotec speakers. Um, but in fact, the coasts of Mexico and Oaxaca are controlled by the Seta drug cartel, who have an integrated business of smuggling drugs, money, and people. And there are now in Huchitan, in fact, there are speakers of Guatemala and Mayan languages there, Hondurans who settled there, uh, Central Americans. So it's changing the context of you know, a Zapotec community, but making it more complex in other ways. It must be hard to be uh, a caquichel or mom speaker from Guatemala trying to make your way where most people speak Spanish and Zapotec. So there's interesting and different sort of challenges. Um, I've done a lot of work with an indigenous organization called the Frente Indígena de Organizaciones Binacionales, the Indigenous Front of Binational Organizations, uh, which has offices in Oaxaca City, in Huxlahuaca, in Tijuana, in Los Angeles, in Fresno, Santa Maria, and some presence in Oregon. And in the United States, there are a million Oaxacans outside of Oaxaca, probably living, you know, very large numbers in the West Coast, uh, in Washington, Oregon, California. Um, and we've seen the proliferation of culture through uh, actually Gelaguetzas, which is a folk festival which, which the state sort of came in and made its own in Oaxaca uh, in about the mid 20th century. But in communities, they have their own Gelaguetzas. So we had actually two Gelaguetzas in Oregon. Uh, we're on our third one this year with dances, poetry, culture in like eight or nine languages in Salem. This has also happened in 25 or 30 communities in California. So there are new ways that language, culture, et cetera, is being deployed, even in the United States, to make more complex 
you know, what is a fiesta mexicana or what is Mexican independence and who's Mexican and what does it mean? So at the same time that there may only be 4,000 Zapotec speakers left in Tehuantepec, uh, there are other Zapotec speakers in other ways that culture is sort of proliferating and media is very important in that. And I'll hand it to Gabi. One of the fears uh, that most people have with globalization and media and all of that and the influence of media and technologies, especially in indigenous communities, is that because of that they will be losing a lot of their traditional ways. But actually uh, media is being used by indigenous people to preserve their own cultures. And, uh, and to extend their cultures in these transnational lives that they have. Uh, one good example is the Pekun Radio in Woodburn. Uh, it's a radio station run by the community, uh, most of them farm workers or the children of farm workers, many of them from Zapotec and Mixtec origins, and, um, and Tricky as well. And they do have um, you know, different hours uh, for devoted to programming in their languages. And thanks to the internet, this is beautiful, thanks to the internet, now they have a patch up with radios in Oaxaca so that they have these hours and days where they can talk to their own families there and send music and send you know messages and all of that. So it's actually preserving and extending what culture is. And what happens is that it's changing the way we should understand culture. Because it's a different way of relating culture and, and manifesting culture. Uh, that it's mediated, obviously, but it, it, it's transforming the way we even study culture. So. with my family and I when I was a little girl but I, I was wondering if um, if uh, these uh, radionovelas the audience first if it's just women or men yeah and the second if it's uh, if it's a pre pretext also to kind of a uh, do a social activity together because that's what I remember from my grandpa my grandmother mm -hmm. and my mm -hmm. aunts and mm -hmm. you know they were just <coughs> you know the yeah. radio novella and they were doing something together, nobody mm -hmm. talked, they were just mm -hmm. listening. Okay, yeah, the, the target audience it's really hard to say. The target audience is primarily women because it's to empower women and to help women break the, the cycle of uh, domestic violence. Uh, some of the, of the episodes deal with that. That's one. But they are doing it in such a clever way that they also are targeting men because there are some moments where they are kind of educating men why you shouldn't do certain things to women, right? So I think the, 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 the target audience is uh, probably the average as in any part of the world for this kind of uh, telenovela or radionovela between 19 and 25 years old because you want to approach that youth, you know. But a lot of people older than that and children uh, also listen to this because of the cultural use of radio. You have radio in taxis. You go, you take a taxi, and they are listening to radio, d music, or whatever. Uh, you go to, you walk into a store in a corner, and they may have the radio on. So it is, I mean, it, 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 it gets to different audiences, but the target audience is probably uh, mostly uh, women. And I wouldn't say it is a, a family activity in the way that, okay, we're going to have lunch and listen to the telenovela or to the radio novella. Uh, but it is something that um, probably schools are recommending it, something that is really interesting that has happened just this year with, with this type of programming is that now Ojo de Agua has also managed to create one, uh, one hour of television uh, programming 
that it's in Core TV, which is the TV station from the state of Oaxaca that actually was taken over in 2006. And a lot of what happened in that taking over was filmed by Ojo de Agua under the name of Mal de Ojo, right? And they were opposed to many of the things that Core TV was doing because they were not focusing neither, ra neither the radio of the state or the TV station on indigenous things. So now they have managed to have one block hour or 48 minutes, which is the standard, for their own program in, t in television and also radio. So I think that, uh, but, uh, but I, I, I wouldn't say it is a very specific family activity. No, no yeah. I wasn't talking about just family, just uh -huh. a social, social activity, you know, like neighbors that they, Know, get together, yeah, that they get like they may get together to listen. I th but I think the way radio is used there is more like organic. You yeah, know, it like goes. It's like it a background. Goes, yeah. yeah, yeah. And even in plazas, this is uh, really interesting because even in the Socalos or in plazas, sometimes they have radio on with their uh, the speakers, right? Speakers because and the television. Because the blast of fire at the yeah. movie, it, uh -huh. does it starts with that. With yeah. them, them so it's very public. So probably they are using the municipalities also to sh showcase this. And you can walk in the plazas or Socalos and also they are watching TV there and they have, you know, movies there, so. getting the youth involved with things like social media, like uh, Facebook. There's Facebook in now, Facebook and other indigenous languages now, where kids are constantly writing. And they might not all use the same alphabet, but they can read each other's work, which is really fantastic. It's been really a fun thing to see that, that kind of thing going on, tweeting, you know, doing, using Twitter in now. So, uh, Second, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, about the yellow blankets, there I have seen uh, mostly from other villages like La Union, uh, village scenes very similar to what was on the market in um, wood. Uh -huh. Weddings, uh, much more like the, the old, old ones. I have photos of Oh, I would love to get something like that. Yeah. Those are the ones that you showed are the, not as primitive or as interesting, actually, <laughs> as, the, as, as some that are being made now, but in different, different Other places. places. Yeah, I think I, the ones I picked I thought might connect with Rolanda's work, the, but you're oh. right, there are more traditional ones with theme that has a greater with historical all, depth. All kinds. And you have some collections yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so one, of, one of the things about uh, at least on the weekends, I, I just read a dissertation on Alebriques from uh, the London School of Economics and Politics um, from uh, a different town than the one we were bringing people to, but in Arasola, in fact, people start, they started as potters. Um, they, they made sort of fake, uh, you know, recuerdos de Monte Alban. Um, sort of ancient artifacts. They did knock off ancient artifacts in clay and sold them because they live right underneath Monte Alban. Um, you know, some people were wood carvers, but there is a link between people who produce pottery and people who are producing alabriques. And the more what you're describing as these family scenes also draw on like Ocotlan pottery and the kind of scenes, you know, these scenes that, that we, we associate more with potters. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. And the pottery, you know, goes back a very long time in terms of the same clay, the glazes, et cetera. You can find people working with the same materials that are found in Monte Alban, in the same places, from the same pits. So it's interesting how that, you know, translates uh, over to this. I mean, Alebriches is a very, you know, contemporary art form. It's not, quote, you know, pre-Columbian or indigenous, there are people who live in places that were Zapoteco, who are making alabriques now, who did other things. But it's 
it's very um, it's very hybrid, I think. Okay, so I think I'm gonna thank you all for your presentations this evening. I, I enjoyed it, and I'm inspired now that I wanna go to Mexico and look at those wonderful sculptures of the animals. So thank you for all that you've um, enriched us with about the exhibition upstairs. And if you haven't had a chance to see the show yet, we are open until eight o'clock. So thanks again. <laughs>